it's also really okay to have like kind of a telenovela about ballroom and that's what it poses sometimes my friend um calls me or texts me and he's like this show is horrible why am i watching it and i'm like but you know that he's like you know you know that it's like you're watching um a more important with more gravity but it's kind of like you're watching um ugly betty you know like just like let it go just like have fun and take your thinking cap off but first a word from our sponsors tax season is coming up everybody it ain't sexy but it's necessary. And for years, I have been filing with BrassTaxes.com. They offer tax help for freelancers, artists, and as their website calls it, other nice people. The sooner you schedule your first appointment, the cheaper it is to file with them. So if you don't feel like you've been getting your money's worth out of quote-unquote free tax applications, head on over to BrassTaxes.com and schedule a consultation today. Let them know Billy Presida sent you. I'll get a little bit on the back end. BrassTaxes.com. Let's get to the show. Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. Shout out to the Vogers, the Posers, and that one guy who's accidentally standing in the runway and you're just like, yo, you need to get the fuck out the way, bro. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Seriously, be mindful of your surroundings, everyone, wherever you are. What's up? What's up? Welcome to the show. If you're new, hey, welcome back. If you're not this week's guest, I have got on author Ricky Tucker. He's got a new book out now called And the Category Is Inside New York's Vogue House and Ballroom Community. This is a great episode for all you Pose fans out there. And uh, we'll chat with Ricky in a little bit. Something on my mind. And I've, I think I've shared something to the sentiment before, but, you know, getting canceled as a celebrity is not real. Okay? It doesn't exist. I know I have some dude bro listeners who are who bemoan cancel culture, who, who enjoy the fun, slutty sex stories, and I'm talking a lot to you. It's not real. It's a fugazi. It's fake. It's poof. It's a, it's a wisp of smoke, okay? It's, it's just a Fox News talking point at this point. It, the, the phrase cancel culture, it has no meaning anymore, okay? Louis C.K. and Dave Chappelle are both nominated for Grammys this year. Getting canceled just means you were publicly criticized. That's not new. Those dudes are not losing their jobs. Getting publicly criticized has existed long before the internet, yeah, sometimes people lose a gig here and there over something. But, you know, when people like lose their jobs and livelihoods, it's usually over something legit, you know, like credible rape accusations or saying the N word on Snapchat, you know, like that's not cancel culture. People don't want to work with people or buy things from people who do that. And when these free speech advocates pipe up about the First Amendment, I never hear them defend porn, you know? I never hear them talk about porn stars who got canceled from their bank accounts because the bank realized who they were in real life. I never hear them talk about Nicole Gilliland, who I talked about last week, getting canceled from nursing school because she used to do some porn. I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with Parler. It's a social media site that launched during the Trump presidency as a backlash to Twitter, censoring only some of the Nazis. And their big thing was free speech free speech say whatever you want no one will censor your speech here come on over to parlor except if your speech is porn when you read the terms and conditions on these sites that claim to be about free speech you'll notice they always carve out exceptions for sexually explicit material of course it's rarely defined what that means but it means porn Whatever porn means to them. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. Is my butthole not considered speech? Would my butthole be more acceptable on this platform if I had a swastika tattooed on it? Sadly, probably. I always call bullshit on the free speech nuts when they don't include porn. Or any sex talk, for that matter. TikTok regularly censors sex education accounts to the point that those creators have to use code words in their video captions to not get flagged. Ever notice that sex workers start calling themselves accountants? Ever notice that uh, TikTok sex educators will say segs, S-E-G-G-S, instead of sex, right? That's, that's just them trying to get around TikTok's bots. 
My Facebook fan page for the Manor Podcast got deleted recently. I don't know when. I don't know why because they don't. They didn't contact me. They're not pointing to any specific uh, piece of content of mine. Although I'm sure it included the word gangbang. And as anyone who has been uh, following my Facebook fan page, you know, would notice I, I'm not posting pictures of gangbangs on there. A lot of uh, episode titles of this podcast have gangbang in it. And I guess at some point the word gangbang maybe was too many times and a some sort of bot, not a human being, decided that I'm too slutty for Facebook. Censorship! Wait, I'm looking behind me and I don't see any of those fucking libertarians. An entire page just gone. No one has answered my appeal. It really sucks when you talk about sex and aren't given the rules of any one platform. It makes me think about George Carlin. George Carlin, you know, back in what, the, the 60s, 70s, he, he had this brilliant bit called The Seven Dirty Words You Can't Say on Television. And it was about how he's just like, I just wanted a list. To do stand-up on broadcast television, and there were certain things you weren't allowed to say, but they wouldn't tell you what you weren't allowed to say. And he's like, just give me the list of the words, and I won't use those words. But no one will tell him the words until they hear something that feels icky, and then they yell at him. When if they had just told him up front, he maybe would have figured out a way to avoid such a thing. And then in the bit, he goes on to discover, he's like, yeah, I, I thought about it, and I thought of more words to describe dirty language than I could think of actual dirty language. To which we get to his very famous seven dirty words you can't say on television. I'll try to link to that in the show notes. These platforms, they won't give us really explicit rules very often. They'd rather just let you post, and then they'll just shadow ban you, decrease your views, cancel your account altogether. They don't, they don't want to be seen as censoring. So they don't want to be seen as saying, please don't say these things or post these things. This is why I've stressed how important it is to share sex positive content on your normal accounts, not your alt account, not your throwaway, the real thing. It's the only way we can grow. The algorithms are not going to amplify a horror show. Having said all that, I have a piece of good news. Years ago, Patreon introduced the adult tag for creator pages. They intended it for like porn accounts, nude photography, hentai, you know, like dirty drawing accounts, explicit accounts, whatever the fuck that means. But me, you know, being the rule following son of a bitch I am, I didn't want to risk my income at the time. And I flagged my own page as adult content, thinking that a show that talks about sex was adult content. Once you do that, you have a different set of eyeballs keeping track of what you post on the platform, making sure you're not actually posting porn porn, just pseudo porn or soft porn or tasteful nudes. In my case, I don't even fucking know because I'm just talking about the stuff. Now, when you're marked as adult content, you also can't be searched for on their website or in the app. Like, you could find me on the Patreon app if you're already following my page, but you can't search for it. You have to go to an exact URL in a browser to give this slutcaster some money. After a while, I noticed that I was like one of the few comedians with a Patreon flagged as adult. There's a popular show called Come Town you might have heard about. It's called Come Town. Come, C-U-M. It's hosted by the Come Boys. And did I mention it's called Come Town? Come. It's Come Town. It's a town full of cum. And it's a podcast with a Patreon that is very successful and is not marked as adult content. A 12-year-old can be a cum boy and join the Come Town Patreon cum page easily. Back in 2020, I appealed to Patreon to finally remove the adult tag with no success. I mentioned my uh, my come town comparison, and I spell comparison C-U-M, because apparently cum is not dirty and filthy to say, so long as there's no actual cum involved. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned the come town comparison among some others, uh, but they ultimately said that my podcast was considered adult, and I asked what I needed to change to do that. But they wouldn't point to any one thing. They just said, you're a dirty whore, and you'll always be a dirty whore to us. Good luck making a living. And that sucked so fucking hard. Because it made me nervous I'd chosen the wrong career path. And, and if you're wondering, like, why is that a big deal, like, those restrictions? Because, again, it's all these things are like a barrier for you to join the Patreon. Psychologically, if you show up to my page at work... 
and there's like a screen that says, hey, this is explicit. Are you sure you want to come in? Well, you were ready to give me a couple dollars and then you got this warning and you're at work. So you're like, ah, maybe I'll do it later. I, I don't want to, maybe I shouldn't open this at work. And then things get busy. You get in the way, you lose the urge to give a couple dollars my way. Um, if, if you are on mobile, it's not as easy to join via a mobile browser on your phone, right? Uh, you wish you could just do it on the app, but you can't search me on the app, right? Where it is easier to join. It's stuff like that. So in a little bit of a win last month, Patreon finally agreed that my page was not adult content, but rather content about adult topics. It may not seem like much, but now a new visitor does not get an explicit warning before seeing my page. It means you can take your phone out right now. You can download the Patreon app, easily search Man Whore Podcast, and join my Fan Whore community. It means one less place I feel monitored. It also makes me panic a little less about my future prospects. I know sex workers felt betrayed by Patreon for kicking most of them off the platform as the site outgrew them. And if payment processors didn't threaten to stop all creators' payments, I do believe Jack Conti, the CEO, would have fought a little harder to figure out a way to keep them on the platform. But what are you going to do? You're going to make no one get paid because of this? We've all seen what's been going on with OnlyFans and AVN stars and Pornhub. It is hard to make money on these platforms if you work around sex. Forget about porn, just talking about it. Because actually talking about sex is still more offensive than a comedy podcast called Come Town. This is the cheapest and longest way for me to get to the fan whore appreciation moment. But here we go. Uh, this is the part of the podcast where I like to um, get out of a rant and get into thanking members of my fan whore community on Patreon. You're all the ones keeping a roof over my head and condoms on my cock. I love and appreciate you more than you will ever know. And I want to show appreciation right now to Magda Moreno. I looked you up on Instagram because I was like, oh, maybe I should figure out like what I can say about her. And I was like, oh, well, where's this chick from? And then it looks like everywhere. Wow, you little travel nut. I hope you're having fun going out and about. And I'm glad that you're taking the Man Whore podcast with you wherever you go, which again seems to be everywhere. Uh, so thanks for being a member. Thanks for supporting the show. And you too can become a member for as little as $2 a month and make a whore's heart very happy. Become a member today, support the pod you love at patreon.com slash podcast, or, because now you can, download the Patreon app and find me in there. And now for this week's guest, Ricky Tucker. Uh, Ricky, again, has got this book out. It's called And the Category Is. It explores New York's subculture of ballroom, voguing, houses, and more. Oh my! I will probably never walk a ball unless the category is schlubby realness. And I think I can nail that one because then I'll just show up the way I am. Uh, Ricky was really fun to talk to. I learned so much and I'm actually sincerely excited to uh, read the book now. Let's go strike a pose with Ricky Tucker. That was a cheap one. I know. When I started this podcast almost eight years ago, that one of the first things I had to do after picking a deliciously perfect name like the man whore podcast was i had to start an account at libsyn because libsyn is the go-to trusted place to host an rss feed which is at the core of any podcast libsyn has been in the podcast hosting service game since before these things were even called podcasts they have the oldest relationship with apple and I trust their customer service when anything is maybe going wrong, or if I just got questions on how to do something new, fun, and different. I tell all of my comedian friends who want to start a podcast that they got to use Libsyn. I even convinced some comedian friends to switch to Libsyn. I love the sleek user interface. I love how clear all the stats are kind of laid out. The site is amazing. They know what podcasters need because it's built and run by podcasters. So if you want to launch your bright new idea as a podcast, you need to go sign up today at Libsyn.com. And you can get up to two months of free hosting when you use my promo code Billy, B-I-L-L-Y, at Libsyn.com or click the link in the show notes. If you switch your podcast over to Libsyn or you start an account with Libsyn with my promo code and you take a screenshot, I'll give you a free 20-minute podcast consultation. I'm just that kind of guy. 
Again, use promo code Billy, B-I-L-L-Y, at Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com, or click the link in the show notes. Now let's get to the show. By the time I was 19, I had the terminology from reading Notes on Camp by Susan Sontag that like that we are camp, right? Like I am camp and, or my sensibility is camp and this thing is camp. A particular uh, example of that is like Strangers with Candy. Like that show is so fucking weird and very queer. Jerry Blank, Amy Sedaris is like she'll fuck anything that's walking. And um, Stephen Colbert and Paul Delano, their characters, the two teachers, like they're in love, but they always play with that like the whole show. I don't think they ever actually like consummate that mm. but they had this like passionate like melodramatic love thing going on yeah. so they, they were all talking to me and no one was like we are gay characters but all of those gar- characters were were gay yeah like or queer right know? um so just sort of sussing that out and talking about the value of those codes and not just them not being good enough you know yeah and but and, and when did you when did you know that like when i know i was yeah. gay oh when i was five by yeah. the time i was five. Oh, very very early. yeah okay yeah but i came out in middle school probably I definitely as by like eighth grade that's when my mom knew mm-hmm. yeah do you identify as bi now or was no, that your your no. stepping stone to no I'm, I'm just gay i don't yeah. i love women but no yeah <laughs> were you ever with women no, I made out with my best friend on my 16th birthday. Who but did it? Right, I mean, right. It was like the first time we got drunk and like we made out. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. I've made out with girls, but that's just like, let's see what this looks like. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Freshman freshman year. So like my crew was just like all like chicks and a gay guy, Vinny. That was my, it was actually <laughs> Vinny? a very fun sitcom name, I think. Vinny, uh, uh, Vinny's <laughs> very much fit my, like I'm attracted to Vinny's by name. Just like what that all means. The loaded, like, yeah. Like <laughs> Long, while, Long Island usually, like it's like up to no good. I love a Vinny. He's uh, Westchester, but he was <laughs> yeah, with okay. someone from Jersey. They were both Vinny's. For a while, Vinny was dating Vinny and we were obsessed that's as, a, a, as a friend group. That's fun, but that's also a crime. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just like, hoarding, just... hoarding resources. That's <laughs> Not great how are the hot vinnies doing yeah exactly <laughs> they're just yeah. both at the gym a lot they're pointed at each other constantly <laughs> uh but i remember like so my girlfriend uh i actually i'm we reconnected on tinder this year but mm-hmm. we knew each other freshman year we didn't really hang out but she was in she lived with my crew mm-hmm. and i found all these pictures from freshman year of one night like welcome week we were all hanging out in this suite and everyone's making out with vinny <laughs> no one's making out with me, by the way. I made out with zero of did these you, girls. You, you didn't make out with Vinny, too? No, I did no. not get to make all out with girl, anybody. All the girls made At out with Vinny. At that point, I've been like, well, I, do, I feel very left out. Uh, no, But like, I have pictures of everyone making out with Vinny, including my girlfriend, who did not remember it at all. That's a shame. <laughs> That's a damn shame. <laughs> yeah. Vinny's hoar- hoarders. They're hoarders. <laughs> but it's a good time I'm here right now with Ricky Tucker, who's uh, the author of the new upcoming book, and the category is... With a wonderful long subtitle that like... <laughs> Inside New York's Vogue House and Ballroom Community. Yeah, yeah a, uh, something I think a lot more people are aware of now with the, with the rise of Pose and such uh, mm-hmm. than, than they were before. You, know, you had Paris is Burning, but... Of course. You know, how many people say my age have, have necessarily seen it? And, and I think more people... Like, I didn't watch it until Pose came out. And then I was like, oh, yeah. there's more stuff to see about this world yeah. that I did not know about. Yeah, the, that, that movie, that documentary has a lot going on in it. And I always go in to try to watch one bit for like research or just to be like, I want to revisit this. They started showing it on planes. Like Delta shows it, I think. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think well, they want everyone crying by the time they land. Well, I, well, yes, <laughs> but that's always their like. That's always the objective. Like, it's like get you there safe and make you cry by watching something <laughs> and and by watch, making you watch garbage. I saw an article somewhere in Vanity Fair or something that was trying to break down why that happens. You know, like something they were like maybe it's the elevation, maybe it's going from a place and going to a place. Mm-hmm. Like something ends and something begins. Right? It's like there's a whole all types of you're exhausted. Right? Yeah, they, but the way the thing fucking ends. I mean, that's just like it's just a it's a uh, that was a. I was very happy when I watched it. That I was alone mm-hmm. in my room where I had like a pillow I could it's, squeeze. It's meditative, yeah, yeah, but sad, but sad. And like a lot of those folks are gone, yeah. and um, and a lot of stuff happened. Like it's so open ended for me. Like Dorian Corey, particularly that story where she, you know, she's one of the most compelling orators in the film. And the whole time we're watching her talk about shade and reading and all this stuff, there was actually a mummified body in her trunk in her um, apartment the whole time. Um, and uh, some friends of mine and uh, folks from the community and writers for the show Pose took that storyline and um, applied it to Electra Abundance, the uh, character that uh, uh, Dominique Tyra Jackson plays on the show. So, so there's a lot of like the show can very much be a porthole into this whole world um, and and 
like you said, Paris is burning, yeah. which has its own sort of mythologies too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you get, you get to the end and you're smacked with a bunch of these people are gone, but the movie's old. And then, so the few people who like are still alive by the end of the fucking movie, you go, okay, let's go, go, yeah. let's go find. And yeah. then you're like, oh no, since then they're gone too. Like, fuck, like this is just. And like, some, you- and some of the people who were there then too, don't are like kind of uh, damaged a little bit from mm. the popularity of that film and them feeling exploited or their careers jumping off. But then that led to other things to like, you know, drug addictions and stuff. So it's really like that film is com- is such a godsend, but also very complicated. Is there a way to cover such heavy topics and categories and, and like uh, press groups of people without anyone feeling some kind of exploitation? No, you know? no. And there's no way to involve folks in like more or less. There's no way to involve them in the process of um, producing it and in the whole sort of capitalistic end of it without someone coming out damaged and someone coming out better. Right. There, there, all- there's, there's no final cut that's going to like get, be the film that it needs to be and make you, your feelings feel okay. And even f- from the most trivial sort of um, um, reality shows like America's Best Dance Crew, there was a Vogue team on there and a lot of stuff, a lot of good came of that. Some folks got like Nike deals eventually and all this stuff, but then there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of exploitation there too. So even from a pop song like Madonna's Vogue, people are split. Mm-hmm. You know, some folks are like, it made, you know, it put us on the map. And then some folks from Ballroom are like, she chewed us up and spat us out and I haven't heard from her since, right? Oh. And some of the dancers sued her and but then they've come around too and been like, I miss her. You know, like, yeah. so it's like, it's very, it's just very complicated and that's kind of the thesis of the book. It's like, this shit is complicated. This This subculture is wonderful. Yes, comes from oppression. Yes, creates freedom. But it's just, it's not one or the other. It's just both. And how did you keep all that in mind while writing a book like this yourself? Knowing that there's no way you could 100% not exploit and still accomplish the goal you want. I put it in the preface. I was like, listen, this book cannot be every any, ev- everything to everybody. It is not the end all be all uh, sort of document of ballroom because I'm only doing one geographic location, New York, where it started. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm only talking to these like 15 people. They're all from a particular sort of uh, era of ballroom in New York City, and I know them. Mm-hmm. So it's not. Oh, sorry. And so it's not. Um, it's not. I'm. I don't want you poking holes in it because I'm already telling you what the holes are. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I know there are holes. There are holes. Can we look past them and like yeah. have a good time or have a good book? It's it's it's. I call it the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. This book, like it's a lot <laughs> yeah. of fun. It's about a fun subject, but you're going to learn something whether or not you want to. Mm-hmm. It's not going to taste like vegetables though, but you will get nutrients. Well, what was your porthole into ballroom? Um, the Madonna's Vogue first. I remember my mom and her gay best friend, Reggie, they were both from New York, but I grew up in North Carolina. So they had both Mm -hmm. come down there. And I remember them getting ready for the club. And then Madonna's Vogue came out. I think this must have been 1990. Mm -hmm. Um, And the song came on the radio. And Reggie, her gay friend, who actually ended up joining the House of Garcon, was like, he called my mom Trixie. And he's like, Trix, do you hear what this bitch is doing? And my mom's like, yeah, honey, she thinks she's one of the children now, right? <laughs> um, and th- I was just sitting there on the edge of the tub just thinking to myself, well, that's funny. You know, like, like, what's Madonna up to then? Why are they so anti this, you know? Mm. Um, that led to around like 21, I saw Paris is Burning. I rented, a, uh, there was a place called Video Underground in Boston. I lived in Jamaica Plain, mm-hmm. um, a little like Dominican neighborhood. And I got the video and I was like, there it is. Like, I didn't know... I'd never heard of ballroom before, really. Right. But I was like, that's what it is. Like, I knew that this exists. All the toxic masculinity in the world, all the, like, shame I have about being attracted to men, all the dancing I want to do that I can only do alone. Like, this is where people are doing it. And I knew it existed somewhere, yeah. you know? And so, and but it also, in that way, felt contraband. Like, it felt like, like, I had a lot of mixed feelings. It was like the hypersexuality of it, the hyper femininity of it. It took me a minute to fully embrace it. I was like, oh, this is offensive, but like also very compelling. You it's know? almost like that hidden porno tape you get. Right? Yeah, yeah. It felt snuffish a little, a little <laughs> bit. It felt a little bit like snuff. Um, and so the complexity of that just like, and I can't, still can't unwrap that. It, uh, there's still, it still feels a little bit like that, which is very exciting um, watching Paris is Burning. So then that became a love affair. 10 years later, I moved to New York to go to the new school to finish my degree. Mm-hmm. And the first class I signed up for, well, the first two classes I signed up for, one was called Old Weird America with the uh, um, critical and music and art theorist uh, Grill Marcus about the history of Bob Dylan and sort of like 
what his intentions were mm. and like what he was de- what his music's derived from and the other one was vogology which was like a class like a dance voguing like instruction class slash theory about you can ballroom. get credits for anything you can get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as a matter of fact those two classes i did one final for both of them hope you got an a i did okay. i got a's on both and it was a it was a folk song i wrote in honor of dorian Corey from paris is burning so it was kind mm. of perfect like it like yeah yeah, and 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 I don't want to make any assumptions about your age, but when when you went to when you found this tape, when you f- saw Paris is Burning first first time, and you were like that. Mm-hmm. What more can you do? I'm assuming you did not have this like full internet, like when I was. <laughs> right? I assume you had. <laughs> I mean, I look by my, the grays in your hair. I assume you had dial up. After I, I, I'm no one to talk about hair <laughs> no, stuff. Okay, no, so I, I'm, 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 yeah, no, I'm 39, and internet was a little tight. So, so um, but because, so, because, like, you find something now, you go like, cool, I can Google, I can search this, that. Like, yeah. what, do, what do you do? You're like, I know there's this world, mm-hmm. and how do you go try to find more of it? It was slow rolling, and I was in Boston, so I couldn't like seek. It never occurred to me to seek out a ball or anything, and. Okay. Or that ball, uh, ballroom would be in Boston. So none of that happened there. Mm. And then I took that class. When I moved to New York, I took that class at the new school called Vogology. And then it was just like, I'm going to follow these two teachers. Where There was um, Robert Simber, who's mm. a South African white man, um, but an artist, used to be an actor. He's a public health um, advocate and um, taught that class and created this, um, created this sort of global... Um, collective called the Vogology Collective that basically is the world's largest art collective. It's all folks from ballroom across the world that are part of it. Mm. And then the co-instructor was Michael Roberson, who was the father of House of Gar- Garçon at the at the par- at that time. Mm. So um, after the class or during the class, I just followed them everywhere. Like they would go do lectures at Union Theological about ballroom. I would be there. Um, they would go to um, Harvey Milk High School over at Astor Place to talk to kids at Hetrick Martin Institute, uh, which are which is made up of a ton of ballroom kids. I would just go there and sit and listen, you know, and just follow them everywhere. And so that started sort of what was the unofficial research. It was really just me hanging out. There was going to be free pizza there. <laughs> So I'm going to go, you know, and then um, and then cut to 10 years after that. So this has really been like, I guess, like 20 years in the making. Um, um, and so when I got actually sat down last year during the pandemic to write the book, um, it was kind of easy. It was like kind of, it was like scarily easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which and, made, it, made it right, I think. And, and how would you define for those who might not be as familiar how would you how would you define ballroom or ballroom culture it, what is that it is a century old um uh subculture made of lgbtq folks that are black and latinx um and they hold these functions called balls where you walk a category so you may vogue um, for trophies and prizes and against other folks. Mm. Um, so there are a slew of categories in there as sort of spin-offish as um, anything over the course of a hundred years. But, you know, in Paris is Burning, some of the more exciting ones were like, you know, um, what was that one? Not Westchester, but... Uh, <laughs> no, there is. <laughs> but like, that's not, yeah, yeah. I, but like, I know yeah. what that town looks and country. like. Town, town, and, country. town and country. <laughs> that was a category. And like, you know, and so it's like, who can dress up as like the fanciest, like upper middle class suburban lady, you know, mm-hmm. or um, schoolboy realness, right? Realness is a whole category that has tons of subcategories that you can make up on a whim if you're having a ball, right? So, um, so what's I w- real? How is realness different than just like a, other categories? Realness starts with passing as um, um, cis, as a cis woman, right? Mm-hmm. That's sort of the root of it. Like, okay, right? Like, if you're trans, we have that term, like you were saying, the terminology wasn't there before. It used to be drag, right? You walk drag, and then realness, you win that trophy if you are the most um, passing or the most sort of convincing, right? right? But then after gender realness, it sort of spans off into just so many intricate uh, variations, like schoolboy, uh, banji girl, uh, town and country, mm-hmm. Um, teacher, um, executive realness is a real one. So, you know, and Dorian Corey actually uh, does a monologue about that one in Paris is Burning, where it's just like briefcase, suit, tie. And like, you know, you're a black man from the Bronx, right? 
no one in the 80s is going to believe that you're an executive, but you come to a ball, dress as an executive, and your friends tell you, your peers tell you, yes, you are absolutely an executive. So so it's these um, celebratory events of dancing and dressing up in a mm-hmm. way and, and community. And yeah. there's also this competition element that um, as a football fan, I can always get into. I can yeah. always be like, I'll throw on a jersey and uh, root out a name. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> the stakes are very high. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, but it's, you know, just like in football, there's booze. Mm-hmm. You know, there's penalties. Like, there's all types there's of penalties. There's penalties what for are like penalties. Okay, so like, let's what's one? Okay, so I'll give you a prime example. So since I just told told you about executive realness, I sure. went to Toronto to a ball f- to do research for the book because a bunch of New York folks were there, and okay. there was a big conference um in, in Toronto, and so I went there. Category was executive realness. Everybody's walking the category. Most of the folks are black. The judges, there are a slew of people, including Michael Roberson, who's one of my mentors from the book and in my life, and Dominic Jackson, who plays Abund- uh, Electro Abundance on Pose. So they're walking the category. A white dude comes up, looks like an executive, and by default gets a little, little bit of a head start because of that. Mm-hmm. And he opens up his briefcase and he goes, I'm here. And he starts handing out papers to the judges, like documents, right? And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And he's like... I'm here um, to speak on behalf of an effort to um, demand reparations for all black folks uh, for slavery, right? Okay. So he was like, a, you get like a wokeness penalty. <laughs> he, he was well, he was like a lawyer executive, I guess, it, which is like not the same thing. But anyway, like whatever. These are all like he doesn't know. Yeah. But, but he just <laughs> wanted to pander to the audience, to the mostly black audience and all black judges, right? Mm. Um. Tyra Dominique Jackson stands up and she's like, I have an issue with this. Like, you know, like it's nice that he wants to like sort of, you know, pander to us, but like, I'm not here for it. Like, you know, like just cause he's a white dude doing executive realness doesn't mean he automatically wins, you know, like this is ours, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think if she hadn't given that speech, the judges would have had a penalty sort of, or maybe, so it could have gone of two, one of two ways. Mm-hmm. He would have been p- penalized for trying too hard and being thirsty like that, or he would have won because he's the inherent identity type that matches this category. Well, yeah, everyone's trying to dress like they perceive that guy to probably dress in real life. That's right. In a police lineup on the street, they would be like, that dude's the executive, right? right. If you knew nothing about ballroom, they'd be like, he's the most convincing, right? Yeah. So, um, so, so there are little technicalities like that, or if like the category is, are these like written down rules? No, but they are definitely hashed out on the spot. So Uh if someone takes issue, they stand up and tell you, I take issue with the the way I see this about to go. And Uh let me tell you why this handmade costume is the category that doesn't look handmade. That looks, you know, like, so there's, or like butch realness is like, that's not butch. Like that's butch, but like, that's too femme. Like, what are you trying to pull? Like they're fights. They're fights. Like, yeah. real fights between people about where this is going to go. What's, like, the wildest fight you've seen? Um, I mean, a lot of the fights that I've... The ones I've seen in person aren't really fights. They're really sort of um, uh, passionate arguments. Yeah. But I've seen... I didn't think... I didn't mean, like, brawl. I meant, like... Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just think in live in person, I haven't seen a knockdown, like, sort of brawl, but they do exist. And I've seen mostly those, like, televised, you know, like, in from documented balls doing research. So no one's really gotten physical. But, I mean, I think in Paris is Burning, there are a couple of examples where, like, the MC is just like, we said this, and you aren't doing this, right? So I think there's... I can't remember the name of the category, but it's something to the effect of, like like butch queen first time at a ball Mm -hmm. so it's basically like you walked in off the street and you're kind of butch but you're trying you're walking your first ball trying to walk realness so you got to like toe a line in between things you have to look like you don't know what you're doing so it can't be actual realness but you have to know enough what you're doing to attempt so specific you That's... have to you have to be at a you have to have been at enough balls to see somebody walk realness for the fem realness for the first time to know that they didn't sh- they have a five o'clock shadow and they're trying to look like a real cis woman mm-hmm. and so that's the category not pass but look like you're trying to pass and failing wow. slightly and so i've seen there's a moment in paris is burning where they're just like no like no like you have to you have to look a little rough for this one, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah, it's very nuanced. It's very nuanced. And the nuances are what cause a lot of the tensions, but you know, it's a critique. It's like, it's both, um, it's both freedom and a constraint. Like it's, yeah. And you've never walked or. or no, I mean, I've taught there. Vogue workshops. I've been to plenty of balls. 
Uh, have I walked to actually a category? Let me think. No, I haven't walked a category, but that's not, that? my, that's not my... Pl- well, I'm a dancer, but with a little D. I am a writer with a very capital W. Mm-hmm. And so, like, you know, like, I, I'm all into extracurriculars, and I dance multiple times a week in front of a mirror in vogue to keep my own personal sanity i also play the violin i don't have to be a violinist you know sure. and i'm a good one yeah but i don't have ever to thought about just like i just want to walk one time for fun or i there's a there's going to be a category and gosh that category speaks to me i'm gonna i'm gonna go for that one i think i may be well so but for the book uh launch party we're gonna have a mini ball and we're gonna ha- and i've asked sort of the f- my friends in the community like what categories should we do for it and they're like oh just do like three voguing has to be one mm-hmm. Um, let's see, voguing has to be one. Runway is another one because it's very inclusive. Like runway is just walk like act like you're modeling and walking down a catwalk, which mm-hmm. takes a lot of skill and is a real category, but a lot of people can walk up with convention and be like, This is how I strut and still win, right? Yeah. Um and then I can't remember the other category, but I'll probably walk Vogue because I have been, wor- I'm like at my own book launch, which sure. I may not get married. So this is kind of like my wedding, my first book launch. Like I need to, about ballroom, mm-hmm. I need to like walk Vogue. So I will in January, but um, but it's never been, it's not something that I feel compelled to do. And now that I'm writing the book about ballroom, it's like, that's my lane. You've really never felt compelled to walk? Not really. even in Even in like your early 20s, I feel like that's when we're or sometimes our most ambitious and such Well, when, when I showed up in New York and started going to school and took that Vogology class, I had just turned 30. So it was like, I also okay, felt kind of okay. over the hill for that. It just, it's just, it's wild to me to like, because like if I go to a thing, mm-hmm. you know, I'm loving it. And even if I don't think I could do it or do it well, I go like, Oh God, I would love to do that once. Well, that's there. Yeah, the, yeah. the sort of the the interest in doing it and the thrill of of getting that reception for being good at a thing, for sure, for yeah. sure. But um, I feel like I respect that runway enough to know that mm-hmm. I can't just be like, oh, I can do this and jump in. There's this um, documentary, and I can't remember the name of it, but um, Patricia Field from um, the, the costume – uh, designer for Sex in the City and a ton of other things, Oscar nominated. Mm. In the 80s and 90s, she had a, a house and ballroom. So she took a lot of white kids from downtown who worked at her vintage shop and took them up to Harlem to the balls and created a house and had them walk. Mm. They had this giant ball for the House of Field. And in the documentary, they show Mark Jacobs getting up to walk a category that had nothing to do with what he was wearing and what he was doing. He was just like, I can do this. Right. Okay. And just got up and everyone's like, yay, Mark Jacobs, thank you for trying. And it was cute. (laughs) But in retrospect, I'm looking at it and I'm like, he should have sat his ass down. Like, that's not for you. Like Mm -hmm. these, the people who actually are walking this category trained for this night and for years, if not for a couple of weeks. And like, you can't just get up there and be like, I can do this. Like, you better fucking, like, bring your A game. And and my, thank God for all those years where I kind of did have that urge to walk a ball, which I can and will maybe. But my real sort of, like, contribution is this book. Mm-hmm. Like, there are people who are DJs. Uh, Mike Q, I in- interviewed for the book, and he's a professional ballroom DJ and also producer. So he produces a lot of tracks specifically for people to vogue to. I asked him the same question when I interviewed him for the book. And I'm like, have you ever walked a ball? Or are DJs part of a house? You know? Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, I'm part of, I can't remember what house he named. He's like, yeah, I'm part of this house. I don't ever have to walk. Some people, I mean, in some categories are so specific. They're like, bizarre is my category. So Lee Solja, who I interviewed for the book, he um, basically just does art pieces with his costumes. And that's the yeah. way he walks. But if you asked him to walk vogue he might just i mean i've seen him vogue here and there but if you ask him to walk vogue he'd be like that's not what i do you know like that kind of thing right and so i do vogue and i do love it but i don't know if i want to compete with it per se but i've been thinking about it a lot more on this book tour because a lot i am teaching workshops and stuff and like i think like there's a certain level of credibility and maybe it could be fun Mm -hmm. but um but i'm in houses if i join a house it's as the sort of documentarian and like oral history sort of um so that's like your role. That's my role. That's your role. That's my in the, role. In the house. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about going to your first ball. Well, at first it was scary. Like I went alone. I had a couple of friends that were supposed to go with me. Both of them lived in Jersey, mm-hmm. and they just didn't come. Or, yeah. And then and so I I'm, could have told you that. Yeah, I know. Jersey, I, they're not coming. I was a newbie. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. And it was in Brownsville, so like they really weren't coming, right? <laughs> like I had no idea. <laughs> Excuse me. So I got there alone first ball ever and i was so afraid and there was was like food in the back like they have hot plates back there for people to eat for free Mm -hmm. 
I was scared to eat, but I was starving. And so I was like, but I don't belong here, you know? And so I just kind of hit out and just like, kind of like sucked it all in. And it's still kind of scary when I go to one because, you know, again, like I don't, I didn't grow up in it. I've just studied it Mm -hmm. and I'm a friend of the community. Right. So like, there's a little bit of fear. Even Um, just in attending, even just in being an audience member. Yeah. And being watched, you know, they're like, who is that? What house is he in? Who is that? You know, like that kind of thing. Is everyone there in a house or are there people who just come in for the love of the game? Um, Most people are are friends of or they're going to walk or they're there to support their house members but um, or their family members. But um, there are some people who are just there and there are people that document it, too. I mean, I took I mean, the first ball I went to in Brownsville, that was probably like 2012, maybe or like fall 2011. Mm -hmm. Um, cut to one of the last like five balls I've been to was in 2019. My, um, my niece and my nephew were coming up from North Carolina for their spring break. They're like teenagers. And I had a kid that I've been mentoring from Pratt school cause I do guest lectures there. And, um, and she's like 23 and I took all three of them to a ball in, in the Bronx. And, um, and my friend Kareem at that point I had gotten the book deal. So my friend Kareem, who's a photographer came with me too to document the whole thing. And before we went in, I was like, all right, we're all black. A lot of us are gay here. Out of the five of us, you might be too, but I don't. We'll see. You know, like, we'll see. You're still kids, but I don't know. I have a feeling, and um, and everyone's going to respect this space. We don't get a free pass just because we're black and kind of queer. Like you have to be good and stay out of everybody's way. Even you, Kareem, who's like six feet tall and taking pictures. I know you have to be in the mix, but like respect people's space. And everyone's like, I know. It's like you don't know. You know, like and this is. I'm saying it to me too. Like mm-hmm. just you know, be respectful. And is, is, what's that? Just like being aware of the people around you, being aware, like don't get in the way of shit, like be aware. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be a place someone's probably going to come in and out of. Let me not stand the fuck right don't in front of that door. Don't stand right in yeah. the middle of the runway. Don't be like, and don't like be standing with your mouth open and not looking like you're having a good time. Like, you know, just like, come on. Like, you know, and so, um, and what was funny is the New York Times was there too and they had documented that particular ball. So I was like, I'm, I was like, this book is a good idea. Let's hurry up. Like, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, and there, so there were like, you know, hipster spec spectators there like white people there there was like you know young kids just at their first ball there was a mix of folks but so my nervousness has shifted now and mm-hmm. become a little bit more focused because i know that i'm not just there to like i'm not just there to sort of like have fun and ogle folks like i'm now i'm there in a context of being an archivist for this community so at a ball sometimes now it does feel like i am walking it but not on the runway like i'm like there to contribute because i'm surveying you yeah. know i'm i'm shocked to learn that like it although it's obviously there are spectators that it's not necessarily this like big open spectator sport in a way like most of the spectators are on a team or with a team of some you know whether they're adjacent to or like in it or whatever yeah uh, that's not you know like oh i'm just gonna go watch roller derby today mm-hmm. it's like no like you probably gotta get an invite or something to be you kind of have to be in the know yeah. and you have to know what to google i mean a lot of people are like they've seen paris is burning and they're like are there balls now and i'm like yeah they're going all around you i mean i think a lot of them in new york were on pause during the covid but not atlanta so much but um but <laughs> he says with some head nod yeah, hey not, i feel the same way about stand-up in new york during covid uh so yeah it's like that. i don't know what they were doing over there but from what i know there wasn't a ton of balls in new york but now they're back on so mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah and and do you want to explain the concept of houses uh because it seems like there are communities within this whole ball community mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so a house is just sort of your team or your um for, for like your really constructive gang it's mm-hmm. like um but it's based on a familial structure so this is where ballroom comes in to replace a lot of the families that we've lost for being queer so mm-hmm. um house mother usually says you're part of our house now and then you walk balls with your house families you have House uh, house fathers sometimes you have brothers sisters aunts uncles like how the, the house mothers picking they're just picking someone out from from the crowd that they is I think it's hanging around I think it's evolved over time I think maybe they've seen you because you usually don't walk without being part of a house so they've right. seen you like come to ball sometimes um, with New York in particular um, there's the direct pathway is sort of the not for profit industrial complex so it's a lot like you go to Harvey Milk High School because you're a trans uh, kid from New York City you have that sort of privilege okay. um, and then you go to Hetrick Martin institute after school and then everybody there is from ballroom and then the kids in the corner have a lot of spunk and you really like how they're hanging out and you find out they're part of the house of uh old navy or ebony right and there's so a house of old navy there's a house that's of old navy house. oh you're... that's my house <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you're like you're like third tier fashion line of the gap, <laughs> the gap, the gap. Where, where, 
wearing head to toe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like pants nine ninety nine. Yes, <laughs> that's beautiful. I always wonder about Old Navy because some of the the folks are just like very fashionable. I'm like, why'd y'all pick that name? Like, what was going on there? I worked at the Gap. Uh, Old Navy is underneath. Like, what are y'all <laughs> thinking? Because Look, then there's Old also... Old Navy introduced me to 2% spandex and jeans, which was a game changer for me. I was yes. like, I can finally look cute. The stretch. I don't, have to wear, I don't have to wear baggy jeans anymore as a thick guy. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Thank happy, you. I'm happy uh, for me you. Me and my butt have been uh, celebrating it ever <laughs> me since. Me and my butt. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Th- there's high end and low end. Balenciaga, Garcon. Like, there's there's houses are usually named... Or not usually. How should I say this? historically have been named for fashion houses you right, know? So, right so that sort of it goes back to realness sort of trying to achieve a certain level in which case then i guess like you can just eventually run out of brands and you're like well there's gap and old navy left yeah well, i feel bad for house of kmart at some point down the line well it's funny you should say because i really have don't been tell thinking, me there's a house of kmart i don't think there is but i wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if there, there were and i bet you very much that they would be very uh campy and sort of ironic like self-referential <laughs> you know like they'd be kind of trashy yeah you know but you were alluding that they can fill in a place for being thrown out of families yeah and, yeah and being threatened with the i mean it sounded like when we were off mic before that like you can relate to that yeah right? so um you know we were talking earlier about implicating yourself in a book like this that's sort of art mm-hmm. criticism but also talking about a subculture and because i am not definitively ballroom but i am of ballroom um i thought it was important to not just interview people about their personal lives, but implicate myself in the book too. And one of the ways that I do that is in the ch- chapter called The Children, where I'm talking about the familial structure and the sort of vacuum that's left when someone's family disowns them mm-hmm. and how ballroom in a lot of ways fills that void. And so, um, so you know, my dad told me that he if, he if he ever found out I was gay, he would kill me, mm-hmm. right? And I needed people to hear that in the book, not just say, you know, ballroom houses – replace your family houses, right? Like that's just sort of like factual data that can really just either go over your head or in one in your... It's very in, simple. It's very simple and it's a sound bite that means nothing. But if I say to you that my dad didn't want me to be fat and made me run in the Savannah sun and then I had a heat stroke and while I was in the hospital with that heat stroke, he was like, I'll kill you if you're gay. Then you'll be like, Oh, maybe you need another father, also right? Like, I'm already trying to lose weight. Can we stick one thing? At yeah, a time can you here? can you pick a crime and let me address? Can it? we deal with like the don't be gay thing? Like, uh, you know, after I've dropped this weight, that you're also yeah. making me lose. Just yeah, one thing, please. and also you didn't even ask me. You just told me I don't want to know, right? Yeah, so like, yeah. so so I think that just um that that narrative structure helps someone feel it more than just hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, and what, and the other end of that is, is that in ballroom, finding ballroom and finding Vogology, I did find two gay fathers, right? Mm-hmm. So it's happened to me. Um, and so, uh, it's important for me to tell that instead of just like taking someone else's story and. Well, yeah, it's too simple to say like, this replaces this. Why did it replace this? Yeah. Right? And, ha- and how? Yeah. And, and like, how? and what's the value of that? Yeah. And what was the value of you finding those two, you know, gay ballroom fathers? Oh, they're amazing. I mean, Michael and I were talking because we did a talk at Beddington. Um, now that the book's coming out, I'm starting to get sort of like guest lecture um, invites. And often they want someone who is like of a house, right? Mm. So Michael came with me for my first gig. And he and I were talking. And he's he is not only just a ballroom sort of um, umbrella sort of person that like touches everybody and does community service and works in activism. But he also went to Union Theological School. So he has a real sort of um, theological and philosophical take on ballroom and sort of its function. Mm -hmm. And he and I were texting back and forth on the way to Bennington. And he said that he's starting to teach at Yale, where he did a guest lecture at Yale. Mm -hmm. And all the black kids from the lecture came up to him afterwards. And like, we've never had a black gay teacher. And I was like, I was like, well, that's crazy. That's Yale. Like, what the fuck? Like, how does Yale not have a black gay man come teach something, you know? Um, really? And, yeah. Well, and then he really? goes, well, but hold on. But then he yeah, goes, how much he time goes, do you spend in Connecticut? Well, well, right. Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. But still Northeast, right? And still one of the Ivies. So, like, how, right? I mean, and even though it's an Ivy, you sh- they should have some awareness of their due diligence, right? they're more accountable or they need to be more held more accountable. So Michael was telling me this and I was like, that's strange. He was like, you, you would be surprised every school I go to. I hear that. And I was like, well, actually now that I think of it, you were my first black gay teacher. Mm-hmm. Like I've had a black gay man. I mean, a black man straight. Cause he was definitely flirting with my mom for kindergarten. And I'll never forget Mr. Tom's. If you're listening, I love you. But, um, but I've never had a black gay man and that changed my life in Vogology, you know? Mm-hmm. And then also seeing intellectualism and seeing gay men be um, public intellectuals like that was important to me. And ballroom gave me all of that. 
being yeah. more than say whatever stereotypes like an entertainer or something like that. Yeah, right? I mean you like, have oh, your, we get to be smart too. You have your James Baldwin's who are invaluable, but I never had one in my own life, mm-hmm. um, and that uh, made a huge difference. And I have ballroom to think for that. What, what was it like that time period in between? I mean, I, I guess do you do you at any point kind of drift off from dad? Oh, you mean like? Oh, well, I haven't talked to my dad in about ten years and i mm-hmm. sort of like i guess was there a time period in between maybe distancing from dad and and finding these two men oh and, it, and is that a floaty type of period so my dad disowned me like a, or just sort of was shitty and we stopped talking for about 10 years after my teens mm-hmm. and then at 29 right before i moved to new york to go to the new school and take that vocology class he um randomly called me and i was he was like ricky tucker this is your daddy and i'm like oh no like what is you know random fucking phone call and we kind of reconnected um he hadn't helped me out very much financially in my life at all and so i thought okay well he said on the phone call reconnecting that i'm gay uh, that he asked my mom if i'm gay she said yes and he said he's okay with it i was like okay that's cool and so then I was like, all right, well, you know what? I'm moving to New York to go to the new school. I need a co-signer on my apartment because I make more than my mother. And I, it's still not enough. Mm. Would you be willing to help me with that? And he was just like, I don't co-sign for anything. I wouldn't even help my mother do that. Your brother and sister would probably ask for the same thing. And I wouldn't help them either. And I was like, well, okay, well, you could have just said no. And that's okay. Um, but instead, you were like, but I'm an asshole in these other ways. So It sounds like he wanted you to know, like, I'm not being an asshole because you're gay. I'm be- I would be an asshole to any of your siblings. Right. And I'm like, well, that's not a good enough answer. Other people said no with way less detail. You could have just been like, nah, I don't do that. Right. Like, what, you know, like, get it together. So I was like, you know what? I'm done asking you for things. This was a very disruptive reconnection. <laughs> why don't you just like, why don't we, I just don't want to talk to you anymore. And if, and I have a feeling I'm going to write a book someday. I literally wrote this. I have, a, and I BCC'd my mom on it so that she could be like, be like, yeah, like at the end. But um, I was like, one day I'm going to write a book and you are either going to be starkingly absent or you're not going to like the way that you are represented. So brace yourself for that and see you never. Right. Wow. And I ended up putting that email in the book. Um, and so like, and that's another reason where I was just like, like, I kind of had like a, a that so Raven moment, like in my head when, when Roshin, my agent was like, do you want to write a book about ballroom? And I was like, yes. And everything that was going to be in it just sort of like flashed. I just had the table of contents in like less than a week. Absolutely. Was, yeah. Cause you're so entrenched in this world. Yeah. And, and, and I just knew like people need to feel that it, you can't just say, people are exiled from their lineage you have to say like this is what it looks like and it's fucking painful and it's traumatizing and thank god there's a solution for that in this community well it's like it would be uh it tell me if i'm wrong it, it sounds like it would be similar to if you know you're just trying to say like oh yeah in the 80s like a bunch of like gay black and brown people were like dressing up and having these fun things it's like Okay, but like, what was that significance and importance? Yeah. What was going on in the 80s? It's not what just a party. The, yeah, like, why did people need to have that party? Yeah, what's the point? What's the socio political, cultural implications of this party, and why was there a need for that? And Ricky, why was there a need for that? Um, because our parents are assholes yeah. <laughs> and homophobic, and, and also have gone through a lot of trauma themselves. Yeah. And like, um, but thank God there's a solution. And that's not to say also that ballroom doesn't have its own sort of familial problems too. Sure. A lot of those traumas that are cyclical and passed on over generations happen in ballroom too. I um, imagine like any sort of relationships between say like a house mother and one of her children uh, would be viewed differently back in the eighties than maybe today where we are looking at those. Dynamics. We're a little bit more aware, just like sort of like everyone claiming to be woke. I think ballroom has a sort of level of accountability that you don't find elsewhere that has grown in time. There really is sure. no sub community that, is like quote unquote safe from that self analysis. There is no dynamic between two human beings that doesn't have a great potential to be neurotic mm-hmm. and sort of pass on trauma. Yeah. Um, but ballroom has a, a, a great, it has those traumas, but has a, um, a heightened awareness of it too. Mm-hmm. Now, when you, you in the early when I when I asked you what ballroom was, you said it's a century uh, century old. Mm-hmm. I think you know, okay, it was. 80s so maybe it had a couple decades before that what is the origin of ballroom so these i mean it's hard to pinpoint but it, well it's not hard to pinpoint there is a specific pinpoint but since that has been pinpointed in 1886 i believe 1886 what 1886 excuse yeah. 1886 so there were to be you know in 1886 if someone said there's an event where a bunch of like queer men are going to get together you'd be like this sounds like a trap black <laughs> men black men in um drag Black up, men in drag up in Harlem, right? Up in Harlem. So, so there's a same time period, by the way, in Coney Island. 
doing the same. Really? When Brooklyn was queer, I'm telling you, I, th- I, th- I think you would really like this. Book. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read really it. Like it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like, yeah, so a uh, group, uh, a lodge uh, of dudes, sort of a, a fraternity of dudes called the Odd Fellows, um, they, which already sort of like hints at like yeah. it's that's the word queer, Odd Fellows, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, they asked permission from their white sort of um, um, lodge in England for them to create their own lodge in Harlem. Mm-hmm. That was all black, the first one. They got that sanction, so they created it. Then they shortly thereafter started doing drag balls, Odd Fellows drag balls every year at Lodge. I believe I, I see. I believe it's seventy three Lodge seventy three up in Harlem. Mm. Um, but um, they started doing them back then, and they were drag ba- uh, balls. And the format of the balls hasn't changed very much. It's very much like black men up there dressing as women for trophies and sashes and and notoriety, mm. but also white hipsters coming from downtown in the village coming up to Harlem to spectate the thing. I mean, I read an article from like 1926 from a ball that was going on and a black newspaper documented it. And they were talking about how there was like 2000 people there and maybe like a third of them were white people up in up sort of spectating the whole mm-hmm. thing. So these, this ecosystem has been around for a while. We just call it different things. Um, there's a friend of my, friend of mine who's writing a book about the first ball that was ever held, and apparently it was by um, a former slave uh, mm-hmm. down in the south. Um, and so, so there more and more information just like keeps sort of like showing up. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that's in the book. An objective is to get an archive for ballroom built. Um, and the Schomburg Center, the Library of Black History up in Harlem, has some um, ballroom information like flyers and stuff from old balls mm. from the turn of the, the last century mm. or the la- the la- the one before last century right um but um it's hard to get to you have to know what you're looking for before you go to that archive so we're um because again you wouldn't search ball you wouldn't search the, you yeah you right. just you have to know what they have in order to go see it right so so it's really tricky we need an uh, an archive that is all inclusive in terms of data that is digitized so has a lot of like for instance that footage from paris is burning mm-hmm. all in one place the stuff the b-roll that hasn't been used because sure. there's so much there um there should be a place in New York for, to hold that. So there's an appeal in that, for that in the book too. Yeah. And 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 race is very clearly a part of ballroom culture. It seems mm-hmm. like from what I look, because it doesn't seem like it seems like white guys had like a version, but yeah. it wasn't called ball. Maybe I mean drag. So I, I remember hearing like allusions to like uh, downtown. They did something else. I mean drag downtown. They did other things, and drag has always been like a thing right like men always want to dress up in dresses because they're told they're not supposed to right so so as soon as you tell me no that's when i want to um and also gender is a construct so we should all be able to wear whatever so of course those things are going on and they're drag kings too i mean at a lot of the balls i just mentioned to you up in harlem there were also drag kings so lesbians dressing up as men as well is that like a newer development is that also like kind of for it's always it's it's always always been there it's always been there and so um so i forget the question uh, I was just asking, like, like, what role does race play in ballroom culture? Because oh. it does seem integral. So, ballroom, that subculture is definitively black and Latin, right? Um, the first woman to... The house system started... This is a prime example. This is beautiful. So, there's a documentary called The Queen okay. um, that was from 1968. And it, wa- it follows a um, drag queen and... Uh, drag pageant so that's the that's the thing downtown there were pageants Mm -hmm. uptown there ended up being balls a lot of the people from uptown who were mostly black and latin would come down to these drag pageants downtown and often wouldn't win because they were black right the queen the documentary featuring the drag queen and event holder uh uh, flawless Sabrina, mm-hmm. who I later met and wrote about her in the book. She I did. just, I just, uh, one of her friends, I just had all, today's episode I released is one for Cayenne Dora show. I don't know if you're familiar. Mm-mm, mm-mm. I don't know. I had to look her up because I was like writing down. Oh, wait, Dora show was her last name because Cayenne Dora show is her name. She's like a black trans sex work activist, but like she kept mentioning like Miss Majors, Flawless Sabrina. And so I like I, this morning, I'm like Googling all these different people she was mentioning. Jack Dora show is Flawless Sabrina's real name. So your friend took oh. Jack's name in homage of Jack, who died, I think, in 2017 or something like that. So, um, and I put Flawless Sabrina in the book because she's just sort of been in my periphery, and I got a tarot reading from her um, as part of the 
Whitney Biennial, like someone put together her doing tarot readings in her apartment near the park. Um, so, um, so that's in the book too. And okay. actually the email registration form and then the tarot <laughs> reading that I got is all in there. But Flawless Sabrina is in this movie called The Queen. Mm-hmm. It just documents this pageant. I mean, yeah, this drag pageant. Um, I think it's called like Miss, Miss, Miss New York 1967 or something like that. Yeah. Andy Warhol was one of the judges. And in it, uh, Crystal LaBeja is a is a black drag queen, and she comes in and um and she thinks she should win, and she doesn't. And the person who does win is this person named Harlow, who's this skinny wayfish little drag queen whose hair is kind of a mess. She just kind of looks like Twiggy, like Twiggy from like the like the model Twiggy, like thin blonde, just kind of like wayfish, very sixties, very factory Warhol days. Like this is what a queen looks like. Crystal LaBeja took issue. Yelled, made made a huge scene in this documentary. It's a famous speech. Sometimes on RuPaul's Drag Race, somebody will dress up as um as Crystal LaBeija and, and cause a scene and like, um, but really her thesis for being so upset about not winning is that she knows she's beautiful and she knows Harlow looks like a mess and the only reason she didn't win was racism and she's sick of this shit, you know, mm-hmm. and so she went. She went uptown after that, took her friends, and created the House of LaBeja, which is the very first house in Ballroom, and created balls for uh, black folks. So it's almost like a um, for us, by us thing. Mm -hmm. And so drag pageants always happened with white folks, but it wasn't Ballroom. Right. You know, and Ballroom is an answer to the limits of brown people in that white drag pageant context yeah. and balls I, I like is voguing the dancing is the like what's i guess what's that deal like what makes the ball the ball and uh, that makes it more than just a pageant um there's pageantry there but it's a lot of course more, pageantry but like but, you know, but, but it's not but it's but balls are like a lot more cutthroat uh-huh. um balls don't operate under congenial under the guise of congeniality mm-hmm. like it's like no i'm here to slay you i'm not here i'm not here to do a queen wave i'm not here to make friends I, yeah save your <laughs> save your flowers i'm here to move right i'm mm-hmm. not here to make friends yeah. absolutely yeah. absolutely um so there's a ferociousness there um yeah i don't know i don't know i mean i think the spirit in which crystal labasia left is the spirit that ballroom continues in where it's just like, no, fuck this nonsense. Like I'm amazing. And I'm going to show you why, you know, who finances these balls. Like what's like, there's prizes. There's, you got to be in a space. There's some food. Like mm-hmm. how does, how, especially in the earlier days of it, when it was yeah. definitely probably a little bit more, uh, way more independent. I'm, I would imagine maybe there's a little more organizational structure these days. Maybe, maybe not. Mm-hmm. Like was, were, were, were there just some like really, passionate financiers in the early days of ball yeah i I don't think so i mean i think people just sort of chip in i mean on pose i mean this is a really good question i've never actually i've only asked michael this once but i think it was in response to finding out on um pose like this like council of mcs so like um on the show billy porter is one of them um jack mizrahi who's actually an old sort of um ballroom legend he's on the show in that capacity there's there's like five mcs from the different boroughs that get together and decide what categories are going to be and Mm -hmm. what um and and chipping in and getting the houses to chip in for the trophies and stuff okay but sometimes there's covers too that contribute to the grand prizes and stuff so it's just Mm -hmm. it's community chipping in gotcha gotcha yeah yeah. that's a good question though always been in the back of my head (laughs) i think i always was thinking about it too and it never occurred to me until i saw a representation of it i was like is that real and then i asked michael hang tight real quick yeah 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 is i took that out right before it got hot again (laughs) but i'm like i'm not i'm not putting it back in right now it's like i'm gonna have to take it out in three days no but uh but uh, you know it it can get a little toasty so i want to get also your curtains look nice Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Your room's cute. Susan Sarandon. Oh, that's my that's my fucking pride and joy. I love her. I got her to acknowledge that on Twitter, and I was like, I'm good now. I can die. Did you interview her? Oh, fucking want to. Still working on it. This, getting her to acknowledge this on Twitter, because like, have, Blue Checkmark serves of, of, uh, the occasional benefit of like another, she'll see it maybe, mm-hmm. and uh, getting her to acknowledge that was like the second step of a multi-step process to one day get my future wife on the show. I'm going to take a picture Please. Of, her, of her, and then I'm going <laughs> to post it on Instagram, and I'm going to help you with your call. Oh, thank you. Yeah. She's, uh, she's it, a queen. I just rewatched I just rewatched East uh, Witches of Eastwick and she was fucking phenomenal. Well, you'll love this. She's covered in porn star autographs. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. 
that's cool. She would love that. He she is. likes younger men. So you, I, I know. Yeah. And I told my girlfriend, I was like, then she's she's into men and women. We mm-hmm. could, if you want a tag team, I would love mm-hmm. to. That'd be, I'd die. You yeah. Could, seriously shoot me in the head afterwards because life won't get better have you been to spin her <laughs> i have not i my skill set would be embarrassing but don't you think she might be there someday i mean maybe she could like one day be like oh let me show you and she comes behind me like you know like those creepy old guys in the old golf movies would was, do to yeah. the 20 year old and be like let yeah. me show you and she wraps her arms around me and shows me how to get a spin on it i'd be like oh and i'm just yeah. i start to kind of back up into susan and i'm like oh hi susan thank mm-hmm. you getting pe- getting like um like sort of like <laughs> pedestrian pegged by susan saran and really just until she puts her hand on the back of my head and shoves me down onto the him, uh and yeah but anyways mm-hmm. that we don't need to get into my susan sarand and erotic fan fiction but i now. also appreciate how specific <laughs> you are with your visions like if this were a vision board i would expect to see you somebody pinned down on a ping pong table yeah well you, you know you mentioned pose and and obviously i i, I gotta ask you a little bit about pose and sure. just what your thoughts on on its representation of the culture. I know I'm asking a big question that you you know could be its whole other thing. No, but it, it's you know. constantly asked. It, it hits a lot of spots. Mm-hmm. It hits a lot of spots, and just like sort of the thesis of the book, it's very complicated. But I will say that like in terms of representation, it's been very positive. Like in terms of acting, like um, M J Rodriguez getting nominated for an Emmy, the first mm-hmm. trans woman. Um, and then a lot of people behind the scenes, people I know are on that show every week and people I know who are in this book, um, have contributed to the content and the writing and the production of it. So that is unprecedented. So that's beautiful. Especially coming from Ryan Murphy, because I feel yeah. like when when you hear like a white guy wants to make this show, you go like, I got to imagine there's a little bit of a... Who's involved is the next oh, question. What's, yeah, what Who's are you, involved? how are you going to do this? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are involved. Like I see every time I t- watch the episode, my um, my gay father, Michael Roberson, who I was just telling you about, he is at the judge's table like every week on the show, oh, wow. you know, and like there he is or there she is and there they go, you know, like that kind of thing. So um, so that's very exciting and very fun. Mm. Um, Billy Porter is an amazing actor, but a lot of the acting is garbage and that's OK, too. Like, you know, like, it's okay to have this sort of end-all, be-all piece called, like, Paris is Burning that is just a monument to this community and everyone's articulate and everyone's poignant and everyone's heartfelt. It's also really okay to have, like, kind of a telenovela about ballroom, and that's what um, Pose is. Sometimes my friend um, Kareem, the photographer for the book, calls me or texts me and he's like this show is horrible why am i watching it i'm like i'm like but you know that he's like you know you know that it's like you're watching um a a a more important with more gravity but it's kind of like you're watching um ugly betty you know like just like let it go just like have fun and take your thinking cap off like it's okay (laughs) it's okay um so it can't be everything and i think it's really cool to have a lane where a show doesn't have to be everything but you still see yourself in it the representation alone makes me cry every episode even if it was boring or you know if it's super melodramatic and and hilarious that's always a good thing too the show's funny as fuck like they're hilarious you know yeah it's a it's a great show i love that show i love that show so and so ballroom ballroom culture is like vague they were like we'll give a thumbs up we're, we're okay we're not pissed about this i think there, are at this point there's so many people working on that show that like most people are like oh, okay it's cool yeah. you know um they're cutting a lot of us a check right now so yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. a check and other opportunities you mm-hmm. know like a lot oh, of they will all move um, so many of them are going to move on to other things to do other things that are ballroom related and social justice involved like it's just it's or they might just get cast on some fucking lame nbc show and good for them because they should get to get cast on bad nbc shows too it w- yes <laughs> yes queer people have the right to do horrible art right right and that's that's when we're yeah that's when it's becoming level yeah. i think yeah. Well, uh, Ricky, thank you so much for taking time to, to chat with me on this. Sure. This was very fun. I'm very sure. excited to read the book. Yeah. Uh, who's Who's on the cover? That was. You know what? I actually don't know the person. So this is this is a fun. It just a. I I I have three photographers for the book. All friends of mine, and one of them from the community, uh, Luna Ortiz, wonderful person, and. The clearing the rights for an image like that, where there's like mm-hmm. 55 people looking at a ball, and then there's one person in the center. We went to that ball in the Bronx that I told you I took my niece and nephew to. The theme was Escape from Arkham. So it was a Batman villain themed ball. And so everybody was dressed up as like the Joker or Two-Face or like, and so my friend Kareem got a really good picture of Two-Face, someone dressed as them, voguing, like, and with everyone just being like, yeah, like hands down while they're doing a dip. Iconic image. But 
that person was like, I don't want to give my image away. And because the thesis of the book is like, don't exploit fucking this community, mm-hmm. then like, I can't do that, you know? So, um, so, uh, the cover was sourced by my publisher, Beacon Press. They already bought the rights. And so it was at an actual ball, but I didn't take the picture sure. and I don't know the person. Yeah. Okay. Which is kind of perfect. Yeah. But also, I kind of want to know who they are. If, yeah. I imagine when it comes out, you will one day get, uh, I don't know the tone of the email, but mm-hmm. you may get an email. Be like, I think I'm on the cover of your book. That would be really exciting. I want to know who it is and I want to thank them and I want to buy them a drink. That is fantastic. Well, yeah. Ricky, where can people go if they want to uh, follow you, uh, re- re- you know, catch up on the uh Sorry, let me say that again. <laughs> Ricky, uh, <laughs> where, where, you know, at post-production, I'm a fraud uh, sometimes. <laughs> I record this mo- the monologue every week. I go like, oh, we got 13 minutes. Guys, you do not want to know how long it took me to do that 13. I'm fake. Uh, <laughs> Ricky, where can people go to see your realness? Oh, I oh, threw a word There in. you go. There okay, you go. Sorry. Uh, um, where can they go to follow you, get the book? And also, if you want to throw in where people might be able to go if they want to explore ballroom, where they would even start. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to do it is literally as simple as um, Googling Mm -hmm. House Vogue Ball March, whatever month you're in, right? (laughs) March 2022. Mm -hmm. And then a list of things will come up there. A lot of them are Facebook um, events. Mm -hmm. So like you'll get notification through that. But make sure you put the words House and maybe Vogue in there because otherwise you'll just get like, you know, like uh, the... uh, ballroom dancing like yeah get the then, then you just be seeing bobby Presida doing her i mean we're very happy she's found a hobby in, yeah. her, in her age and her late 50s but also you know y- y'all did not go to see that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you'll get dancing with the stars and that's not what you want <laughs> um, and, and where are you about oh so you can find me on instagram at rick tour scale um it's r-i-c-t-o-r-s-c-a-l-e um that's my handle um and then i'm also on my website the writer ricky tucker.com the writer ricky tucker dot com mm-hmm. well ricky thank you so much uh i, I feel like i've learned uh, a lot uh and i i i'm gonna start working uh on on my ways into the uh, house of old navy because i yeah, guess yeah. those are those might be my people yeah um, as I'm, much as it's a family it's brand identity too so you know <laughs> you should know yourself and that's that's very attractive yes <laughs> well, why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody ricky bye everybody Thanks again to my guest, Ricky Tucker, for coming on this week. Uh, Go get his book. It's out now, and it's called And the Category Is. Ah, seems amazing. Uh, Folks, I am probably, hopefully, relaxed and trying to not get sunburns on some beach on some island right now. Uh, So I hope you... (laughs) I hope you enjoyed the pod. Send me an email with your comments, your questions, your titty pictures, your criticisms, whatever, however, uh, to manwhorepod at gmail.com. Would love some casual beachside reading. You can share your thoughts on this episode as well as any episode and connect with fellow fan whores in the champagne room. Uh, I love seeing more and more people coming on in and saying hello. Introduce yourself today at manwhorepod.com slash discord. And if you want to support the Man Whore Podcast, you know, hey, you can always, uh, I, I got my Venmo and Cash App, they're always in the show notes if you prefer that type of method. If you're a crypto person, I want to say crypto guy, but technically be crypto, but you know, aren't all genders of crypto people crypto guys in a way? <laughs> Anyways, if you want my wallet ID because you want to send crypto instead, feel free to, but the best way you can support the pod and get a slew of great rewards is by joining my Patreon and you can do so at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash podcast. I hope you're doing okay out there, you know, whoever you are and wherever you are. I know it's uh, kind of scary and confusing times. Kind of feels like the spring of 2020 all over again. You're just like, ah, I don't know what to do. You know, try to make good decisions, whatever those might be for you and the ones close to you. Please protect yourself and others around you. Get your shots. And for your own sexual sanity, stay slutty. What was, were, how, uh, I guess this is semi two part, but one, how, when you first went to your first in person ball, mm-hmm. how tapped into you, how, oh gosh, word orders. <laughs> How tapped in were you to um, like gay culture and a gay scene? And um, if not much, 
like what did going to a ball do to tap you into a world 